Well, I'm not a, a fan of the group, but there's a musical group, They Might Be Giants, that recorded a song uh, that's the theme song of the TV show Malcolm in the Middle. I, I don't watch that show either, so, you know, I'm like hitting zero so far, but at any rate, the, that song is entitled, You're Not the Boss of Me, right? Uh, this picture, I mean, all of us have been there at some time or another, like this little kid. We might not have pounded quite that way. We might not have folded our arms quite the same way. But in some way, at some time, every one of us has said to somebody, you can't tell me what to do. We don't like being bossed around, especially if it's by somebody that we don't think is our boss, right? We don't like that. Well, in this morning scripture passage, the chief priests and elders came to Jesus in the temple courts, and it might be more appropriate to say that they came after him in the temple courts. You know, they were always on his case about something. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? Right? Now, they weren't just asking some random question because according to John's Gospel, just a day or two before this, Jesus had done what is called the cleansing of the temple. He came into that court of the Gentiles at the temple, made a whip of cords because people were selling sacrificial animals there. He drove the animals out. He turned over the table of the money changers who changed uh, the current Greek or Roman coins into temple money because the temple money didn't have any images stamped on it the way that uh, the Greek and Roman money did. And so they made a huge profit doing that. Jesus said, not only are they taking up this place that should be a great place of prayer, you're robbing people blind. And so he raised Cain there, kicked them all out. And so I think when the chief priests and the elders came after Jesus, while he was teaching in the temple courts, and they asked by what authority he was doing the things that he did, I don't think they were asking a legitimate question. They were saying, in effect, you're not the boss of us. Now, he was just an itinerant rabbi. He wasn't a temple priest. But he came in and disrupted a day's business for the high priest and his family. You know, the, it, was, it was big business. Um, in today's money, the cut that the chief priest and his family had from all that sale at the temple, in one year it was six or seven million dollars the, the last time I calculated what it would be in today's money. So this was big bucks that we're talking about. And Jesus disrupted that. And they, the chief priests and elders, were really ticked at him. Who do you think you are, Jesus? Why are you doing that? Now, I don't know what they thought they were going to gain by doing this. I, suspect that they thought they would just embarrass him and run him out of town by coming and asking him uh, questions like that. What they didn't expect was that he was going to ask them a question in return. He said, okay, I will tell you by what authority I'm doing this if you answer one question for me first. John's baptism, was it from God or was it just a human whim. When you heard that as Jackie was reading it, they kind of put their heads together and said, well, what, what are we going to say here? If we say that it was from God, then 
He's going to say, well, then why didn't you believe him if he was speaking for God? Because the chief priests and the elders attacked John the Baptist. They sniped at him. They probably talked bad about him in the coffee shop. They probably talked bad about him around the tables and talked about what a disrupting thing he was and how wild he was and didn't comb his hair right and he ate locusts and wild honey for crying out loud and dressed in that same filthy camel hair suit all the time. They didn't do that. They didn't stand up for John. They didn't believe him. Instead, they attacked him, and they didn't defend him when Herod arrested him and eventually executed him. So they said, well, we can't say that he was from God. That would put us in a pretty bad light. Well, but if we say that all of this was just something that people made up, my gosh, the people are going to stone us because they all believe that John was a prophet. What are we going to do? So they came back to Jesus and said, well, well, we don't know where John's baptism came from. He said, well, if you won't answer my question, then I'm not going to answer your question either. Fair enough. After that exchange, though, the question still remained of where Jesus' authority came from. Now, Sometimes you might see that parable about the guy with two sons. You might see that as a totally separate issue. I don't think so. I think it was just part of the same whole conversation. Because the first thing that Jesus said in that parable was, what do you think? So he was still talking to the chief priests and the elders, carrying on this conversation, talked about the, the, the guy with two children, or two sons, and said to the first go work in the vineyard and the son said I don't want to know I'm not going to go but then later on thought better of it and went and worked like his father told him to and then he went to the second son who was really the compliant one I mean gee go back to this to the pre yeah look at the body language here right look at Look at this kid. I mean, he's not interested in paying much attention to his dad, is he? No, he's kind of the weasel of the bunch. He was the one that said no. But the other one is the, yeah, dad, I'm on your side. We're quite a team here. At any rate, okay. So he told the first one to go. First son said, I don't want to. So he went to the second one, and the second one said, Yes, I'll go, sir. How great is that he even called his father, sir? I, I don't think either of our boys ever called me, sir. Right? <laughs> you know, uh, the respect was just dripping off of him, the enthusiasm, and you would see that and say, Oh, what a good kid. That just warms the cockles of your heart. But he never went. Gave a good show, but never really went and did what his father told him to do. Hmm. But Jesus didn't follow that up by saying, well, you know, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do. Everybody can figure that out. He just said to everybody, which one really did what his father wanted? And they all said, well, yeah, it was that first one. And then Jesus Stuck that zinger in there. And he said, you know, the tax collectors and the horrors are getting into the kingdom of God before you. Those are the people, the chief priests and the elders and all the good religious people look down their noses at. But yet those were the ones who believed John who turned their lives around, who turned from a life of dissipation, is that a word that we use anymore even, to a life of just wasting themselves and wasting time, 
involved in stuff that doesn't help anybody, turn it around to a life of righteousness and goodness. They were the ones who were enjoying the joy and freedom of forgiveness. They were having changed lives. But even when the religious leaders saw this, they still didn't believe John. They still didn't get on board with him. They still didn't speak out for him and support him. When was the last time you saw somebody's life really changed by the good news of Jesus Christ? And what's the proof of a truly changed life? It's not just somebody saying, oh yeah, I'm going to live differently now on. That doesn't quite do it. I think that Jesus was saying in telling this parable that John's authority didn't just come in some kind of a package from heaven or from people to him. His authority really came from the fact that his ministry was changing hearts and lives. His ministry was making a difference. And because of that, because of changed lives, that is a demonstration of authority. And if the elders and the chief priests would have been paying attention, would have cared to open their eyes and look, they could have looked at the people whose lives were changed by Jesus' ministry. They could have looked at people like Zacchaeus, you know, little Zacchaeus, the tax collector, who turned his life around because of Jesus' ministry. Or Mary Magdalene, who was crazy and had seven demons driven out from her by Jesus. Uh, the madman of Gadara, who was possessed, possessed by a, a legion of demons and didn't do anything but run around naked in the graveyard and scream. He became calm, went back to be with his family and love and support them. And Lazarus, who had been dead, and Jesus raised him from the dead. All of those people are fruit, are proof of Jesus' ministry. They're proof that Jesus is who he says he is, proof that he is the one that has the authority to do things like kick money changers out of the temple, to kick the merchants out. They are Jesus' ministry proves that his authority is from God. As I was working on this sermon, I started thinking about a pastor that I met when I was in seminary and then serving the church for a few years in Kentucky. A little Japanese guy named Paul Tashiro. Paul was about this tall. Right? Just a little guy. Fairly stocky, but he was a little guy. And Paul's story is pretty remarkable. He was raised a Zen Buddhist in Japan. He was 12 years old the last year of World War II. And uh, wanted to do something for his emperor and for his country. And so he volunteered at 12 years old to be a kamikaze pilot. Now, Coriana and Caden, you guys, you guys know what a kamikaze is? You know. Uh, it's a, okay, the kamikaze pilots were suicide bombers, Japanese suicide bombers who would fly planes into uh, American and Allied warships during World War II. And uh, his scheduled suicide bombing mission was scheduled for August the 16th, 1945. They were going to do what they did with all kamikaze pilots. They'd get them drunk on sake 
and they would put them inside a, a plane loaded with explosives with just enough fuel to get out to the American fleet, but not to fly back, and they would weld them into those airplanes so that they didn't have any choice. They were going to die one way or another. Their thing was just to try to take as many people with them as they could. And any of you who know a little bit about World War II history know that the day before Paul was supposed to go on his kamikaze mission, August 15th, he was supposed to go on the 16th, August the 15th, 1945, Japan surrendered. It was just six days after the Enola Gay dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. And Paul said that he was devastated. He felt like he had no purpose in his life anymore. The emperor was not a god. Japan wasn't invincible. <clears throat> invincible. He didn't know what he was going to do. Now, when Paul shared his story with a group of us in Kentucky, he didn't talk about the next part because after the war for the next four years, he ended up working for the equivalent of the Mafia in Japan. He sold drugs. He pimped. He lived a very immoral lifestyle. And he was walking around in some city, if I remember right, it was Tokyo, but it might have been some other large city in Japan in October of 1949, and there was this tent set up. And he wanted to see what was going on because it was full of people, a lot of noise coming from there. So he went into the tent and it was an evangelistic meeting. He said he heard the gospel for the first time in his life and accepted Jesus that night. He became a translator. Paul is really good with languages. He became a translator for the mission organization that was sponsoring that evangelistic rally. And uh, God started working in Paul's life. God healed him of tuberculosis in both lungs. Um, and God eventually brought him to America and to Kentucky where he became a pastor and that's where I met Paul Tashiro. Uh, like I said, little bitty guy. Here's a more recent picture of him and his wife, Aiko. That's probably still 20 years old. And I don't, I don't know how big she must be because I never met her. But he's this tiny, so you can imagine how dainty she is. She must be like one of those little Lego dolls or something like that. Uh, but I don't, I don't even know if she is still living. Uh, Paul is now around 86, I think. Yeah, he's 86 and lives in Lexington, Kentucky. He is a professor emeritus of biblical languages at Wesley Seminary. He's a brilliant guy. And so I thank God for Paul to shoot him for the way that God worked through him and changed his heart and his life. And that is just one of the many ways that I know that Jesus has the authority to do whatever he wants to do, whether it's in the temple, whether it's any place else. And I thank God that even if we don't want to, we can still say to Jesus, Jesus, you are the boss of me. Glory be to God. Amen and amen.